Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Sound for Video session. Today is the 12th of April, 2020. Happy Easter to those who celebrate Easter and happy Sunday to those who don't. Uh, just uh, do a sound check here real quick. I was monitoring here. Everything's sounding good through the part of the audio hard, uh, audio signal chain that I can hear. And uh, just give us a thumbs up here if everything's sounding okay out on the stream. Welcome, everybody. We have people from all over the place today, it looks like. Um, we've got Dehan from Norway, 4 a.m. Wow, that is commitment. <laughs> Lloyd Puckett uh, is going to get his coffee. Hope you got your coffee there okay, Lloyd. Uh, Daniel is looking forward to our Resolve 16.2 discussion. Me too. Uh, Rob is coming at us from Winnipeg. Peter from Hamilton, New Zealand. Alejandro is here with us. Carlos from Rio. Rio, very good. Um, Mark Randall, I believe coming from Germany. Uh, very good, okay, loud and clear, loud and clear. Exactly 11 p.m. in Rio. Audio is good. 3 a.m. here in the UK, excuse me, in the UK. Um, very good. All right, well, let's get started. Uh, we have a little bit of a, we have a lot of things to cover today, actually. And so I wanted to just run through things here. Um, first of all, we're going to take a look at the new Rode Wireless Go White. This just came in, and uh, I thought we'd take a quick look at it. I've already, already reviewed it, but while we're here, let's just go ahead and take a look. Now, um, on the main channel, I did a review of this about a year, almost exactly a year ago. Um, they came out with the black version first, but the the white version is basically the same, except that it's white. And so the idea here is that you would clip this onto your talent. And the idea is, that, so for example, if I'm, do, I'm doing a lot of corporate interviews, so for me, this can be something that'd be pretty handy if someone's wearing a white shirt. I would clip this under, so this part right here would go underneath the button placket, and the only thing really showing would be the clip here, um, advertising road, but it's usually not too conspicuous. Um, and then, of course, we have the receiver. Just a really handy uh, sort of problem solver. It's not something you would use on a big budget production, obviously, most likely. Um, some people have used these on consumer grade cameras as camera hops. So that's another option you could potentially use it for. Um, kind of a low budget uh, camera hop. I believe this one's gonna come in at $200 just like the last one. Comes with all the same things. You have these little wind muffs you can put on. Um, goes something like that. Not the most sturdy connection. I thought they had done something to change that, but um, unless I'm missing something here, that's not holding on really well. I think it does well in terms of managing the wind, but uh, anyway, it comes with the pouch, the TRS cable, so we've got a stereo mini jack, so that's going to go into most consumer grade cameras. You can also adapt it to XLR, and if you needed to go into a phone, you could get, they have a separate cable, or you could just use one of their TRS to TRRS adapters, so you could go into a phone to camera. XLR input with a uh, VXLR adapter and oh, get actually two of those nice and then one thing I like there are little touches here which I appreciate uh, Rode gave you actually two USB-C to USB-A cables so you can charge both of them simultaneously which is good um, rather than just shipping it with one cable and uh, not being able to to do both of them at the same time. So anyway, there is the Rode Wireless Go White. Next up, we're going to jump into Fairlight 16.2. Now, I actually compiled the questions. We have actually a number of questions that we'll get to in just a little bit here. But um, there were some of these questions about Fairlight I cannot answer. But I'm hoping that with our community, we can and um, get, at least get you pointed in the right direction. So let's uh, let's take a look over here at the fair light and let's see we we'll just get that set up there there we go okay all right pull my microphone just a little bit more this way um so there are a variety of things here that are kind of and again i'm just i i have not switched to davinci resolve it's not it's not what i edit in 
It's not what I mix in yet, but it looks very, very promising, and so I've been keeping an eye on it. Um, we have a kind of a fundamentals course that should show you kind of the very, very basics. That course was actually made in Resolve 15, but uh, we're going to have to work on updating that to 16.2 and above. But they've added a number of features that I wanted to run through. First of all, one that's kind of an interesting one is an import, an AAF format from Pro Tools. So I think what they're trying to do is make a move to make this more competitive with Pro Tools because Pro Tools has basically, it is the digital audio workstation that is used for film post when you're when you're talking about anything with a substantial budget. So I think what they're trying to do is make a little bit of a play for that. So now you can import those AAF files. Those um, Oh, it changed up the mic. Oh, yeah, I think you're talking about this. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so tonight we're working with the TZ Audio um, Stellar X2 Vintage. It's supposed to sound like a... Um, U47, but it's not a it's not a it's not a tube mic. But anyway, so yeah, that's what we're working with tonight. Um, so anyway, so it looks like they're making a play for getting a little bit more of a foothold in the film world, um, which is interesting. Fairlight has been used, I think, a lot in broadcast traditionally before Blackmagic bought them, but I think they're also trying to make a move for uh, film in, in a little more with a little more effort. <laughs> so good for them. Um, the next thing is that you can actually now do automated loudness normalization. And so you can see here, let me just close the inspector. There we go, gives us a little bit more room there. You can see here we have a stereo track. This actually, this track was normalized to minus 17 LUFS. I know that because this is, I've, it actually came from the video that we posted on the main channel today. And if I right click on this and move on down to normalize, I have a variety of different options now. Of course, you can go with the peak normalization, which is kind of the traditional, just look for the sample with the highest amplitude, move that sample up to whatever you specify here. So to your target level, in this case, minus nine dB full scale. So take that sample with the highest amplitude, move it up to minus nine and move all the other samples up the exact same amount, the same number of dB. And that's kind of your traditional normalize. But what we have now, for example, is we have the ITU standard here. So this is the latest ITU standard. And you can see here that we now can specify our LUFS and our dB true peak, which is pretty cool. So they've automated some things that were not very automatic. Now, <laughs> there is a, there's a catch. Let's just take this and I'm gonna say, Let's set that to minus 17. And it actually made the waveform smaller. So now let's measure it. I'm gonna reset that, press start, and we're gonna go ahead and play through some. So I'm gonna get some headphones on here so I can hear what's going on. Here we go. In this episode, we'll take a look at the Audient Evo 4 audio interface. In this episode, we'll take a look at the Audient Evo 4 USB audio interface. In this episode, we'll take a look at the Audient Evo 4 audio interface. Okay, stop right there. Now you can see that in terms of our target, target, uh, we're almost spot on. Minus 0.3 is pretty negligible. So the question is, what is our target set to? So we'll come up to the File, Project Settings, come down to Fairlight, it's set to minus 23. So remember, we told it to normalize to minus 17, but it's basically gone to minus 23. So <laughs> I think what's happened in essence is, let me just go and close this here. I think what's happened is that when you come to normalize here, I think once you set the standard, it's basically not 
taking into account these parameters yet. I think they're basically stubbed out, but they haven't been actually wired in yet. So it's a great step forward, but it's not there yet. <laughs> so if I want to publish something to web, um, and I want to get to minus 16, minus 17 LUFS or thereabouts, this is still not going to do it just yet. It looks like maybe either I'm missing something or um, they, they just haven't completed the functionality just yet. But clearly, they are heading that direction. And so I applaud them for that. Thank you, Blackmagic Design. You're definitely headed in the right direction. Now, I'd like to be able to do that at a track or a bus level as well. So obviously, um, or at least bounce something and while I'm bouncing it, also normalize it to a loudness standard. But we'll see how they, you know, how things move along. That's definitely a step forward. So great job. Um, not quite there yet, but getting much, much closer. So thank you, Blackmagic Design, for taking that into account. All right. The next thing I wanted to cover is 32-bit float audio. And 32-bit float audio is not something that Resolve supported in the past. Here's a 32-bit float file. Let's just play through it. This is a test here. We're recording 32-bit float, and we have pushed the gain trim quite high so that we are clearly exceeding 0 dB full scale. Okay, so you can hear that's clipping, and I apologize. I should have warned you that was going to be kind of loud. Um, the the waveforms obviously are you know visually chopped off, but what what happens when we grab the tr the clip gain and we pull that down and let's pull it down to about there now just visually it looks like it's treating it like a 24-bit file it's actually showing the waveforms as still chopped off however when we play it back listen to this this is a test here we're recording in 32-bit float and we have pushed the gain trim quite high so that we are clearly exceeding 0 dB full scale. So good news and bad news. Good news is that it actually is processing that in 32-bit float. When we attenuate it enough, we're recovering all of the information that would have been lost if we were recording in 24-bit. So it's actually reading and processing 32-bit float. That's great news. Only bad news is that the waveform is still drawing in 24 bits. So <laughs> still some work there. Again, applaud uh, Blackmagic Design for making a step forward. And hopefully we'll, we'll see the, uh, the waveform drawing updated as well in the near future here. So definitely little steps here. And what, I, what I'm seeing here basically is an iterative process. They're just taking steps at a time, releasing often. Um, and that's what you typically see in agile software development or iterative software development. So good steps forward. Something that's going to make me want to jump over to DaVinci Resolve right now. Eh, still a little rough, but uh, definitely promising for the future. So I think sometimes people say, hey, Curtis, why are, you so, why are you so rough on Resolve? Resolve is amazing. It does so many things. And yes, that's true. Um, but some of these things make it a little bit challenging to work with. And, um, but I, like, like I said, I am very, very hopeful for the future. And clearly the steps they're taking right now point to a brighter future where they're really doing a lot of things right from my standpoint. All right. Um, let's come over here to the project settings and take a look at another thing here. There is a Fairlight tab. So they've actually moved out things out for Fairlight to a separate tab. They used to be I think they were in general options before, but they've now moved them out. So you have a couple of things. So first of all, it's going to show you your sample rate, of course. This is where you're set your, your target loudness. And this is what the meters are reading when you're metering in real time, the loudness meter. So it's, it's metering the difference from this target that you're aiming for. That's what the minus 0.03 was when we were working with it before. Now it's showing... Well, right now it's showing plus 13. <laughs> Um, but in any case, this is the target you're aiming at. You can tell which scale you want to use, and you have a couple options there. They're both EBU plus 9 or plus 18, and that's basically um, how much visual meter you have available to you. The others I haven't looked into as much yet, so more to come on those. But in any case, Again, it's, it's, it's promising to see that they've broken things out to a separate Fairlight tab. That, that says to me 
that they're very much investing in this, and so they're moving forward in a very positive way. Uh, one thing you also probably heard about is they now have an effects library, or sorry, excuse me, a sound library. And there's some interesting options here. So I just went searching around. So here's a little bit of wind. Actually, there's a toy winding up. Window blinds. Cleaning a window with cloth. <laughs> Let's look up water. Nice thing about these, these are all royalty free and you can use them in any of your projects. Nice splash there. A little bit of bathing water. Mop movement. Pouring. So anyway, you get the idea. They seem like they're high quality and seems like some pretty handy things. Now, there were some footsteps too. There were surprisingly not as many footsteps as I would have expected. Let's just say... Oh, I was wrong. More than I thought. Some in stereo. Interesting. Interesting. So you can see there are a lot of uh, options here. So this, this can make uh, doing the sound design and the Foley work in some of your projects a little bit easier. A lot of the recordings are already there. I prefer to record my own, but if I've got something here that's going to work, that could save me some time. I'm happy to use those as well. So really nice that those are available as well. Now the last one I haven't actually had a chance to play with, but it looks super useful, especially if you're going to use any wild lines in your projects. And if you're not familiar with the concept of a wild line, a wild line is when you record an actor saying one of their lines, but you're not recording any video with it. And the idea is that sometimes if you feel like, you know, during a take, the director was happy with the visuals, but you weren't necessarily entirely happy with the sound, you can go record some wild lines and have the actors read through some of their lines again just to make sure that you've got what you need. Now the trick with that is in post, it won't always line up perfectly, but what Elastic Wave allows you to do is to stretch and match things. So you'd find that right in here, and I think what you can do is you can just set these different points here like this. And then you can see how you can stretch things. And what it does too is it prevents the pitch from changing when you do that. So let's just play through this here. Whoops. See how that sounds now. I don't even know what I'm saying here. So first of all, an audio interface like the Evo 4 is a device that you connect to your computer via USB. And what it allows you to do is play back sound from your computer, either to headphones, or you'll notice here to powered speakers, which we have balanced line outputs here to feed to powered speakers. So you can see it, it did a pretty good job there. Now that's an extreme example, obviously, we probably wouldn't speed it up that much. But the idea there is you could tell that it wasn't substantially changing the pitch of the audio, which is really, really important. So. That could be a really useful tool. Again, lining up those wild lines or ADR lines to production picture. And uh, that makes it super easy. So really nice job there as well. So there's a quick look at some of the new features in Fairlight. Now, um, there are probably a ton of other things that I haven't touched on, but that just kind of focusing on it from an audio perspective, the things that kind of caught my eye, just wanted to run through a few of those really quickly here. 
and show those to you. All right, uh, let's jump back over. Um, we have a couple of other things to cover here. So we looked at Fairlight a little bit. We looked at the Rode Wireless Go White. And, um, oh yeah, there's an online film contest coming up. So I've asked to be, a, I've been asked to be a judge. Uh, there's a fellow by the name of Garrett Sammons whom I just met. He has a YouTube channel and he does some commercial video work. He's, I think, mostly a, a director and he does some camera work as well. But he has a online film contest he's hosting. There are prizes if you're into this. And again, this is only if you're interested in from a standpoint of, you know, you're kind of cooped up in the house and, and you don't have a lot going on. <laughs> if you want to practice your skills, this would be a good opportunity. So he is essentially the contest is there is he's setting it up as, you know, make it make the intro sequence for a film or web series or TV show. It, can, it has to be at least a minute long, no longer than two minutes. And basically make like the title sequence or the opening sequence for that that show. And it has to be called isolation. There are some other rules as well. Um, if you go over to this URL here, you can see all of the details. But he asked me to be a judge for the uh, contest. And so I'm looking forward to that. He put up his own sample of what he would do for an opening sequence and he did a really really nice job so if that's of interest to you definitely check that out it looks like a fun one coming up here all right i'm going to take a quick look at the uh, comments here and see where we're at greg asks, what's the ebu and um Kevin says it's a, it's European Broadcast Union, so it's a yeah it's a, EBU is usually in front of all of these standards that they lay out. So that's what the EBU R one twenty eight is. It's a European Broadcast Union standard for broadcast loudness. So, <clears throat> all right. And then Greg also asks, is not well. Let's go ahead and put this on the screen while we're here, because since we can, is not LUFS measuring really for your final master track? What's the value of applying it to normalizing individual individual components of the sound design? Yes, definitely. In terms of the the final master is the one that has to meet the targets if you are going to broadcast. The sometimes I will use it for individual clips if I'm just trying to get things in, a, in the same ballpark. Um, so for example, if you're switching, if you're going from, you know, kind of a rough, if you, when you're starting your rough mix, sometimes I'll use the loudness just to get things in the same ballpark. And then by ear, I can kind of tweak them to really fine tune them. So yes, absolutely right. Just so that there's clarity here. And I'm glad you asked that, Greg. The, um, the LUFS and loudness normalization is not normally something you would get really technical about at the clip level. It's really for your master, you know, your master bus really, and the final output. That's where it really matters. So great point, glad you brought that up. All right, um, Trevor asks, still waiting for Premiere Pro to be able to read audio time code and convert it to file time code. I agree, Final Cut Pro as well while we're at it, definitely. Um, for those that are not aware, DaVinci Resolve does do that. Um, it runs into problems with some camera time codes. Uh, with, with all of their cameras, it works beautifully, of course. <laughs> um, I did try it with some other DSLRs. I had the Nikon Z6 and um, I think the Panasonics too. If you feed audio time code into those, the Nikon in particular had a tendency to not record the audio until you were a couple of frames into the clip and Resolve had a hard time figuring that out. And so 50 of the time it could figure it out 50 percent of the time it couldn't i don't know if that's changed but that was one of, that was kind of my early experience with that <clears throat> it's about time for black magic design to release resolve 17 so let's hope going from 16.2 to 17 will fix those issues that'd be great uh alejandra i'm very sorry uh that was really loud on that 32 bit you're right Okay, um, Whooper Video asks, why don't you publish with minus 23 LUFS as EBU R128 conform file? Not sure I understand the context of the question. Apologize for that. Um, but normally that's the idea. Yes, especially if you're going to broadcast. Um, Mark. Yeah, that was not picture in picture. That's the that's the viewer in Resolve. So that was the actual video clip that went went with the audio originally. 
So that's what you were looking at there. Not that wasn't picture in picture. <laughs> All right. Mike asks, um, if your track has lots of cuts, clips, will normalization work across the entire timeline? I didn't see a way for that to work, but I but I think what you could do is highlight everything in at least in a track, possibly the entire timeline, like essentially a, a command dial A or a is that a control A in Windows? Um, and then right click. Still need to need to determine that. So it's something to look at. All right. I think we're up to date. So let's jump over to the questions that were submitted ahead of time and see what we've got over here. Had some interesting ones this time. So uh, first off, let's see here. This is from Mark. Mark asks, how should various recorders react to being left running as USB interfaces? Earlier this week, I uh, had my Zoom H5 connected via USB and powered on overnight. And when I started recording again the following afternoon in the same still open project, the audio was noticeably distorted as if it had been sh slowed down and pitch shifted, which could only be corrected by restarting the H5. Are recorders being used as USB interfaces expected to be able to be left running for extended periods? Would you expect there to be any issues with hooking up a higher quality recorder as a USB interface with external power and leaving it turned on for potentially months? That is a great question. Now, I don't know that there's a definitive answer to that, but from my point of view, um, the trick with the H5 is it's really, to be honest, a more consumer level device, prosumer, consumer. Um, does it surprise me that that happened? It, unfortunately, it doesn't. <laughs> it would be nice, it, but but I would expect a Zoom F series or a Mix Pre to do better at that. I don't know if it would really be a great idea to leave it on 24-7 for several months, but um, I don't know. It's a good question. I, I, I'm, I'm sadly not surprised that the Zoom H5 had that issue. So... I don't know if it's expected or not, but I think the reality is is that um, this is yeah, not kind of not surprising, sadly. But I don't know. I'm interested in other people's opinions on that. So let let's hear what you have to say as well, Mark. Thanks for that question. I think um, I think once you move up into the Zoom F series and the Mix Pre, you probably would be less likely to run into that. But I don't know. I haven't. I don't generally do that. I power off in between sessions. So. All right, James asked a question. Lately, I've been using Fairlight in DaVinci Resolve to edit some of my podcasts because A, I have it, and B, I'm more familiar with it than Pro Tools, Reaper, and others. Number one, what I have noticed is, is if there is an audio, if there's just audio on a timeline, Resolve will not let me deliver it, that is to say export it, without an image on the video portion of the timeline, even if I'm exporting as wave only. The Add to render queue button is grayed out unless there is something on the video part of the timeline. I typically just put a still image there and deliver audio only. Yes, and I don't think that's, well, you didn't really put it as a question, but um, yes, <laughs> there's a quirk there. Um, that's why I, it. sometimes people ask, you know, is there a good free digital audio workstation app? And I, and I say, yes, definitely resolve. And it's Fairlight module, but it's a little quirky. So if you're trying to use it for music, I mean, you could just drop an image in there and then export the, uh, you know, the the audio only as a WAV file. That's fine, um, but it does have some some funny quirks. So yeah, definitely some things to keep in mind there. Number two, is there any way to deliver an audio only as an MP3? The only option I see is WAV. I've been exporting a WAV file then converting it to MP3 via Audacity. Thanks for all you do. Stay safe, everyone. As far am I as I am aware, there is not an MP3. Um, encoder option in DaVinci Resolve. Again, it's mainly made for um, sort of cinema workflows and typically you would not do any sort of MP3 encoding. And then even when you are, when you're encoding the video, it will put it in AAC format encapsulated into a container with the video. Um, but I don't believe it'll do a separate, as far as I know, a separate AAC or a separate MP3. So. Yeah, it looks like the workflow is still going to have to be a little bit wonky and move it over into Audacity or some other app to do the MP3 encoding. So thanks for that, James. All right, next up, Rob. 
I use Fairlight to edit and do 95% of the mastering of audiobooks, audiobook files I record. I then export the almost finished files into Audacity so I can check if they meet the ACX Audible technical requirements. Audible uses RMS instead of LUFS for loudness. Is there a way I can measure in RMS in Fairlight? Further, how can I measure the noise floor of a file in Fairlight? Now, this is one that I don't know the answer to, again, because I just have not used... Um, I, I just haven't used Fairlight enough to know the answers to that. So if anyone else knows the answer to that, it's a really good question. I just don't know. I do know that there is a real-time analyzer, a uh, frequency analyzer, um, often called an RTA, real-time analyzer. So, But I don't know about um, RMS measurements, especially if you're trying to get... It's not like Audition where you have that um, the amplitude statistics module, which is really, really useful, which is... Part of the reason I'm addicted to audition, to be honest, um, it's a really nice way to work if you're trying to do those kinds of things. But I'm not sure if there's any way to do that. I'll keep my eye open and we'll come back to that, Rob. It's a good question. And then the next question, can I visually EQ an audio file? Let's get back to that so you guys can see it. Can I visually EQ an audio file in real time in any of the native Fairlight plugins or will I need to get an external plugin suite for that? No, you can definitely use the... Um, the native ones. Again, there's an RTA, a real-time analyzer, and the EQ is right there in the channels. In fact, let's see if we can pull it up here and I can show you really quickly. Come back over here. So here's your EQ. So you definitely have that. And then I think in the Fairlight... Just got curious. Sorry, I got distracted. <laughs> there, I, I was reading through the documentation. In fact, there is an RTA somewhere in here. Um, I remember reading about it last night when I was looking through things, but I didn't find exactly where it was, and I didn't see your question until this morning, Rob, so I apologize. But yes, there is an RTA in here somewhere. You can use that. And actually, it may just show up right here on the EQ. Feed to powered speakers. And you can also, of course, record. You'll notice there are two inputs here with XLR combination jacks. It does not appear to show in the EQ plugin itself. Um, but yes, there is an RTA in there. If you do a quick search through the manual, you'll, you'll definitely see it. So incidentally, the manual is actually really helpful as well. Um, it's huge. In fact, the, the section on loudness, which I did read in a little bit more detail, starts on page 2,992. <laughs> And that's not the end of the manual. It's close to the end of the manual, but it's not the end of the manual. So um, it looks like it's a 3,000 plus page manual, but it's, you know, it comes in digital format when you download and install. So definitely, I, I usually throw that into another folder just so I have it available to me whenever I upgrade. And um, actually, let's see if we can do a search here right now and see if we can find something here for you. Um, let's see, come up here, RTA. <clears throat> oh, good grief. Thousands. Um, let's frequency analyzer. There we go. Uh, it's actually a plugin. So let's come back over here. There you go. And there's also a instrument direct. So the, with that and the EQ plugin we showed earlier, you should be able to get what you need there. So hopefully that helps, Rob. Fine question and thanks for asking it. So Rob, if we wanted to hear some of your recordings, what are some books on Audible that we should check out? I'm just curious. That's something. If that's something you can share, we would love to know about it. If it's not, we totally understand. So, um, and so, Robinson, so what you're saying, Curtis Jet Audio, is I should RTFM, and I'm not going to read that out loud. But no, that's not. No, we're here as friends. We're here figuring this out together. No. So you've got the RTA plugin. 
you've got the EQ plugin. I don't think I don't think there's a need to go off and get a, other plugins. I think those will work nicely for you. Um, but I am curious what some of your projects are. We'd love to hear some of them. All right, um, let's come back over here and see where we're at. Okay, next up from Nolan. Hope you're feeling better when it comes to building your sound gear. Yes, I am feeling better, by the way. Thank you very much. Um, when it comes to building your sound gear, do you recommend buying over time? I was curious how you started accumulating your own gear when you started. Yes, definitely bought it over time. Now, what's interesting is that you kind of have to, it depends on, <clears throat> it depends on, you know, what you're doing. So if you're trying to make a full-time living at this, and you're in one of the film centers throughout the world, Hollywood in the United States, you know, Los Angeles area, Atlanta, uh, New York. Yeah, these are all places here in the United States that I can think of that are that I would consider a film center. Um, then you will probably, in either case, you'll have to build your kit over time. But I think if you're trying to make a full-time job of it, what you may end up having to do is probably rent for a lot of your jobs up front, but over time, as you do more jobs and you accumulate a little bit more cash to spend that could potentially save you some money, but still, you know, you're still gonna rent out your kit when you have, whenever you have a job, but you could start investing in some of those things that you pretty much need on every job. So obviously you're gonna need a mixer recorder of some sort. You are going to need, um, you're probably gonna need at least some wireless. You're gonna need some lavalier mics, but a lot of times, for example, I have, um, Currently, I'm, I'm actually hoping to invest in more, but right now I have two channels of my audio limited wireless, plus I have some additional, you know, I've got some Deity Connect and I've got some other things that I can add if I need to, but if it's a larger budget job, I can always rent more. Um, but usually I just use the ones I have on hand and it's usually fine because it's, you know, usually they're gonna be two actors that are kind of the main actors and, and the others are general, at least on the things I'm working on, the others are gonna be a little bit more periphery and they're not going to be as important to the overall thing and I'm and you know a road link even I've used in a variety of circumstances so there are some thoughts there in terms of how I've done it um, but other people may have some advice as well so definitely interested to hear but the types of things that I would that I think most production sound mixers if you're doing again full-time that most of them invest in at some point is they will have a recorder mixer at some point they'll have their own cart um, they'll have enough wireless to fulfill their needs on most jobs um, and then they'll rent what they need beyond that and again remember you're always going to be charging for your kit so whatever that involves so obviously if you're going to have to rent stuff that goes into the kit fee along with a regular kind of fee that helps support and maintain and replace eventually your own kit that you own already so those are some things to keep in mind there thanks for that Nolan all right next up from Cheap RV Living Wells. Um, so I had, it's a long question, so I didn't put it all here, but I just put the questions here. But let me give you the background that he provided. Um, number one, he is shooting outdoors with a Canon 80D and or a phone. And he wants to improve his audio quality. And he, uh, one of the things he's proposing is, should I get a DBX-286S? which for those that are not familiar with it, it's a, essentially a channel, a rack mount channel strip. Um, I guess I have to confess, I kind of scratched my head because <laughs> that's not something you would typically use outdoors with a, you know, when you're shooting with a Canon DSLR and or your phone. Uh, so it's a pretty unwieldy piece of gear. It's kind of big. You're going to need a, a rack mount type of thing of some sort. Maybe you have a cart. I don't know. I don't know what your rest of your setup is. So back to the question here. So the question is, would the DBX280, oh, and actually he has a blimp that he puts the, he has a Rode NTG4 Plus um, that he uses in that, but he uses that only for talking head because I guess I'm assuming that he doesn't have someone to um, boom the mic. He's just putting it on a stand of some sort. So anyway, first question, will that work? Any reason it couldn't or problems to watch for it? And this is in regards to the question about the DBX286S. It's kind of big. I, it wouldn't be my first choice for adding to that kind of setup, but it could work if you're willing to take a big, uh, you know, not a big, it could be a smaller rack, but you're going to have to take a rack of some sort and you have to have AC power. Um, so it doesn't, you know, there's no included DC powering option as far as I could see. So you're going to have to have some way to power it as well. Number two, can I run 
the mics into it from either the Wireless Go or the NTG4 Plus with no problem. Well, the NTG4 Plus would go into it without a problem because that's, of course, an XLR-based microphone, and that's what the DBX286S input is. So that's not a problem. Wireless Go, you could as well. Um, so... Yeah, you, you, I think the answer to number two is yes. Number three, and this is my big question, how do I get the signal into my ADD or cell phone for it to be recorded? I think the DBX286X uh, uses a quarter inch cable out. Can I just use an adapter from quarter to 3.5 millimeter and then into the camera? No, unfortunately you cannot. The output signal on the 286S is line level. The input on the Canon ADD and the um, I think the other one you were asking about was the wireless go. Oh, or to your mobile phone. Both are microphone level inputs, not line level inputs. They're not switchable to line level. And so what you'll need is not only an adapter from quarter inch to 3.5 millimeter, but you'll also need a 3.5 millimeter attenuator cable to bring the level back down. So it's kind of, um, I don't mean to be critical here, but I think this is kind of an odd setup. Like it seems really heavy and really invasive for what you're trying to accomplish. So um, my, my take is probably, you could make it work. Um, is it really gonna give you the value you want? It seems like a bit of a stretch. So anyway, so there's some thoughts there. Four, is there a better solution? Well, I'm not entirely sure what you're trying to accomplish. Um, <laughs> sounds like you're trying to not do any post-processing and have the compression already done, kind of have a very polished audio signal straight into the camera so you can publish right away. Um, I mean, I guess if if you have the budget, you have the way to support the 286S out in the field with some sort of power. If you've got a rack that you can put it on or a cart or something to, to haul it around, if you, um, you know, you use those adapter cables to get it out and into your camera, yeah, it could definitely work and that could solve that problem for you. Do I know of a better solution than that? <clears throat> well, not something that has a compressor, de-esser, and, um, you know, a noise gate and an enhancer, you know, like the high frequency enhancer on it. I don't know of anything else that has all those features that's smaller and DC powered. Maybe somebody else in the, um, in the chat could, could leave us something that could point us that direction, but I'm not aware of any that can do that. So um, in any case, number five, I'd like to find a good portable recorder mixer, Tascam, Rode, or question mark that does all that the DBX does, but I don't know of any. A few have a compressor, but not many have um, the many outstanding features of the DBX. And that's, th yeah, I agreed that I think the um, your number seven question is, could the roadcaster be an alternative? And I think the answer to that is yes, that could do it. It's more of a podcast type thing. And that would probably be a little easier to power out in the field. They <clears throat> road announced that they're going to have this adapter that allows you to power the roadcaster via USB, or sorry, not via USB, but with like a USB battery bank. Um, but they haven't made that available generally. It was only to people that were bought the roadcaster within a certain time frame and that time frame is up and i haven't seen that particular cable available outside of that special offer so that's a little weird but I, I think they're working on making that generally available from based on what i was told from them so all right um so yeah i think that the trick is that the dbx is a really pretty specialized kind of channel strip and channel strips generally come in rack mount format so i don't know of a recorder that has all of that built in Maybe someone else is a is a yeah. So American Liberty mentioned here, yeah. Maybe the Rodecaster Pro could be it. So that's probably the closest that I can think of. It's not really it's not something you would operate from a bag really, but from a cart it could certainly work. So I think um, that's probably your best bet from from what I'm seeing. That or one of the well, even though the Zoom Live Track the L8 doesn't really have a compressor. I think you'd have to move up to the L12, but the Roadcaster to me seems like it has all the things you're looking for. It has, it has a compressor, it has a de-esser, um, it has a noise gate, it, and it has a high frequency enhancer. So yeah, it has basically all the same things as the DBX. So I was just looking over here at my DBX just to <laughs> refresh my memory on what it has. All right, so thanks very much for the question there. Appreciate that. 
All right, moving to the next one. Let's see here. From David, is there a way to add or change time code in audio files post-production? Let's say someone forgot to set up their time code while filming and wanted to copy the time code from the video clips to the audio files while editing. Yes, there is a way. I'm going to answer the question technically, although I don't entirely understand what you're trying to accomplish there. But the technical answer is yes. You can use a free application from Sound Devices called Wave Agent. Um, by the way, I also checked that can work with 32-bit float files to change the metadata. It just can't play them back. So <clears throat> um, that came up on a previous session as well. So if anyone was wondering about that, um, you can use Sound Devices Wave Agent to do that. <clears throat> but yes, Sound Devices Wave Agent will allow you to change the time code value, the timestamp, metadata value to anything you want. Now, I'm not entirely sure how that's working into your workflow, so I don't know how to answer it beyond that, but technically it's possible. The thing is, is if someone forgot to put a time code generator on an audio recorder and you don't have time code, I don't know where you're going to see the, the information, like the right time code stamp for each audio clip. Um, so I'm not really sure how to answer that part of the question, but technically it is possible. All right. Um, Alejandro who was here just a few minutes ago. I hope you're still here, Alejandro. Um, what do you know about the Era 4 bundle plugins? So this is from a company called Acusanus. Um, we actually covered them in a Sound for Video session some time ago. I think it was sometime late last year, if I recall. So if you just do a search on YouTube for Curtis Judd, Acusanus Era 4, you will find that video and you'll be able to see what I think about it. <laughs> I recently heard about these, but since I don't, uh, do any sound editing. I just wanted to see if you've had a chance to play with them. How do these plugins differ from the Isotope RX-7 Advanced? Well, um, that's a good question. So I think from my point of view, the, the denoiser worked pretty well. It had a pretty, the Era 4 had a pretty interesting um, it had a pretty interesting kind of algorithm that it used where you could actually record with two microphones and that was useful for helping, I think, with the de-reverberation. So that was kind of an interesting thing. Um, but I didn't necessarily find it to be a lot more effect, excuse me, more effective than the RX-7 de-reverb. Um, in short, I think the Era 4 bundled plugins are pretty good. I was actually quite happy with the denoiser, which worked well. Um, I think basically they're a less expensive way to get into those plugins if you need to. Obviously, RX-7 Advanced is very expensive. And so I think if you're on a tighter budget, it's a good option. If you have RX-7 Advanced, I don't see any reason to also have the Era 4 plugins. That's my my read on things. So hopefully that makes sense there, Alejandro. Um, finally, which microphones do you recommend for voiceover, ADR, and Foley recording? And how great is Fairlight for these capabilities? All right, so that's where I don't have all the answers as far as Fairlight. I haven't used, I haven't done any ADR in Fairlight, but it looks like the, the tool set or the feature set is pretty rich. Um, and I think it would be a pretty good way. In fact, it's probably the least expensive way to do a proper ADR session. So I would say pretty great from that standpoint. <laughs> um, I don't know about fully recording. Fully recording, I would probably you could do it. You, yeah, you certainly could do it in Fairlight. I typically do it with a with a field recorder, just because I'm usually moving around. So I don't have a fully studio properly. But um, if you are doing it in a studio, then I think that could be a fine way to do things as well. And for voiceover, I have not done voiceover in Fairlight yet. Yeah, not yet. If they keep heading the way they're direct, they're going, I probably will spend a lot more time in Fairlight here before too much longer. So um, now let's go back to those microphones. So which microphones do you recommend for voiceover, ADR, and Foley? For voiceover, that's a tricky one. I think here, for example, again, I'm using the TZ Audio Stellar X2 Vintage. Um, this one, I think, is a pretty good fit for my particular voice. And I think that's really the answer is that Ideally, if you're in a treated space, that a, conden a large diaphragm condenser is probably one of the better choices for doing voiceover. I'm just gonna move this up just a touch here. You'll notice one thing I do here, I actually put this more at nose level 
Um, my voice has a lot of sibilance and doing that kind of gets the best results on this particular mic for my voice. And it also puts it up a little bit so you can see my face <laughs> out of the way. But um, I think really voiceover microphones really kind of need to be tailored idea in an ideal situation should be tailored to the voice actor's voice and um, there's some really good kind of general all-purpose microphones it seems like for example the Rode NT1A is one that I've heard a lot on a lot of different voices and I've never ha heard it sound really really awful that's a good choice um, obviously if you can invest in something like a lot of studios have Neumann U87s um, that's a $3,600 microphone um, but that generally sounds really good on most people's voices. Um, if you're working in the kind of a much smaller budget range, I think that's where you need to do a little bit more research and kind of tune it to your voice. So if you're talking about something for your own voice, what I would do is do enough recordings to kind of get a sense for what are the kind of, you know, unique things about your voice. Do you have a lot of sibilance? Do you have a very, a lot of low end energy? Do you want to kind of emphasize low end energy because you don't have a lot of it in your voice? Um, do you have more of a mid range voice? And once you have all those kind of a kind of that understanding of how your voice works, then going out and watching reviews, but but make sure that you listen to samples that preferably are not processed and listen to them on as many voices as you can to, to start to understand what that mic tends to emphasize and what it tends to de-emphasize. And that'll help you kind of make that choice for what works best on your voice. Now, once we're done with this pandemic, another thing you can do if you're in the United States, go to a guitar center. They have a lot of mics, large diaphragm condensers that you can try out there at the store. So that's another thing you can do if you're trying to fit something to your own voice. Um, and I've actually seen that some of the trade shows is a little bit harder um, because you're on a show floor. But in some cases, I have seen things where they've set up a variety of different microphones and you can actually talk through them. The problem is you're on a, noise, a noisy show floor. So there's a lot of other stuff going on around you. And even though they have headphones there, it still can be difficult to hear everything that's going on. So those are some thoughts there on voiceover mics. So there's that. And then you talked also about ADR. For ADR mics, my typical approach is try to use the same microphone they use during production. That's going to make it less jarring, especially if the ADR is kind of spotty, where it is only needed in certain clips or certain lines. Um, if you can stick to the same mic they used in production, I think you're going to save yourself a lot of grief. Now, if you don't, if you use a different microphone, there is always... Um, RX has a tool that is, is um, where you can actually uh, EQ match two different microphones. So that's an option. But again, if you can stick with the same microphone, I think that just saves a lot of grief potentially there. And you're going to that's going to be a good microphone. Typically, it's going to be, you know, it'll be a... One of the Sennheisers, uh, the MKH series, or something like that. So um, maybe a Chef's, you know, they're ideally that's what you could do. If not in post in RX, you can do the EQ match. So there's also the new dialogue match um, from Isotope, which is that same module plus some other things. It can actually also match the reverberation of a room, which is really helpful as well to really kind of fine tune the ADR recording so it fits into the mix overall. And then finally, uh, Foley recording. For Foley recording, I've typically used shotgun microphones to good effect. So the most recent one that I worked with, I used the Rode NTG5 with a really good results. That's a very natural sounding shotgun microphone. That worked really well. Um, Sennheiser MKH416 is used a whole lot with Foley recordings, and I think it, it does a nice job. The nice thing about using a shotgun microphone for Foley recording is you really isolate the Foley sound that you're trying to capture. Um, so I think that's typically why shotgun microphones have been used in those circumstances. But you could use any microphone. You could use a, you know, you could use a, an MKH-50 if you wanted to do that. But um, in any case, there are some thoughts there. So thanks for the question, Alejandro. All right, next up we have a very interesting question from Dick. And let me just grab something here. Go ahead and start reading that. <clears throat> Going to get a little something set up for a demonstration here. Okay, so Dick is asking, he uses a Shure SM7B. He feeds that into a DBX286S. Well, that's a common theme for tonight, it looks like. 
Um, that goes line level into a sound device is 888. Can you show me the best place to gain stage the sound? Sometimes it's too hot now. All right, um, let's, t let's actually talk about that. Just doing a little setup here, okay. With anything, when you're gain staging and you're going through several devices, you always start at the start of the signal chain. At least that's my, my approach is to start at the start of the signal chain. So with the DBX-286, of course, first you're gonna set your input gain or your gain trim. Now, one, in one interesting thing to remember about the DBX-286S is that when you get to the compressor stage, um, it's, it uses kind of different controls. It's interesting. It uses a drive control, and then it uses a density control. So rather than the traditional threshold um, attack, release, ratio, um, and then makeup gain, it uses a drive. And drive essentially is another amplification stage, if I understand it correctly. So you're going to be boosting things even more when you go into that compressor, especially if you're using the compressor quite a bit. And then essentially the density is sort of a combination of the attack and the ratio, from what I can tell. Well, no, actually, I, I guess the drive would be the ratio. And then the density would be the attack and release. Not entirely clear. It's kind of a different approach. Um, so you are already boosting those levels more. So you may have to pull down, this is where you may have to go back to the start of your signal chain, pull down the trim on the incoming, um, but you're gonna have to experiment with that. Now, then of course, you'll go through the de the enhancer, and the, noise, the expander gate. And then at the very end of that signal chain on the DBX-286S, there's the output. So you'll just wanna make sure you're not clipping there and you've got a little clip indicator. So be conservative. Then you're going in line level into the 888. So from there, if you've done your gain staging correctly in the 286S and you're not clipping there, then you should basically have the, the input set to line level on the 888 and you shouldn't need to adjust the trim. It should be basically, you should be able to, to leave it at zero. So that's that's the main thing I would look at there. <clears throat> Don't A lot of times people start second guessing themselves and start playing with gain at different, you know, with devices later in the chain. Stay away from that, get it right in the first part of the chain and then just pass it through as much as possible is generally how I approach it. If anyone else has other, um, other advice on that, definitely let us know in the, in the chat here. Okay, so the next question here from Dick. Let's put that back up here. A, sound, a second question related to that that I want to, to output that, I assume from the 888 to a GH5, and input this into an ATEM mini switcher. I want to route the sound signal into my GH5 from my 888. Can you show me how I must route this from input one to the right output in my 888? I route this to avoid delay problems as much as possible. And I assume you mean sync problems there. So, all right, let's take a look here. So here we have uh, the 888. Let's see if we've got that all right in screen. So I can't really pull it out very well right now, but there is an X5, X6, 3.5 millimeter output over here on this side of the 888. And you will use that to feed the audio with a stereo mini jack cable to your GH5. So that's the cable I would use. <clears throat> Now you will have to set up the routing there. And when you come into the outputs menu, you come into the X1 through X8 and you'll come down to the X5 output. Now what you'll route to that will typically be the left bus. So you'll just send the left, or if you wanted to, you could just send the individual microphone. So if you just have the Shure SM7B and it's on one, I would send that out either pre or post fader. So, um, I don't know if you're doing a mix. Probably just, just one microphone, you're not. So you could probably just do it pre-fader, just like that. All right, and then you're gonna come back out and do the same thing for X6. Um, so you probably wanna send input number one pre-fader there as well. I'm assuming you have your Shure SMBs attached to input one. Okay, then you can come back into the, well, what you would do is you'd come over here and send tone out at this point. So to, to send tone, you just uh, move this slider over, oh, whoops, this slider to the right, this little switch here. Now you can see we're sending a minus 20 dB tone out. Then what you'll want to do, and you can see some of those inputs are actually turned off, 
Then you will look at the meters on your GH5 and adjust them so that they're also at minus 20 dB. So you're probably going to set your input level to minus 12, to be honest. In addition to that, you're probably going to have to come back into the outputs menu, into each of the X4 and X5, and you will have to adjust your gain down here. And I'm going to guess you're probably going to need to drop it to, if I had to guess, somewhere around minus 45. Um, but you can go as low as minus 50 before it mutes. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to get the meter on your GH5 to hit minus 20 dB. And that's how you do it. So hopefully, Dick, that makes sense and that gets you where you need to go. So I'm going to reset everything here because um, I would typically send the left there. And I might send the right mix here. So that's just, I'm just making myself, I'm keeping myself sane. <laughs> so when I go to do a job at some point when I need to feed that out, I'm going to send the left and right mix. And then you can turn your tone off once you have the camera hitting minus 20 dB as well. So that overall is how you would do the routing for sending audio from the 888 to the GH5. All right. Let's see. There's one last thing here um, from Dick. I use Final Cut Pro to cut the video and want to process the sound. I can use RX7 Advanced, but my question is, what are the best steps to clean up and normalize the sound to go out by YouTube? I know you addressed this before, but can you give me guidance and show where to look for more information? Um, yes. I would, well, see, here's the thing that's important to keep in mind. RX-7 is not a mixing application. It's not a digital audio workstation. It's a cleanup application. And it's actually, I find it pretty useful as far as doing your final um, loudness normalization as well. So, Dick, what I would do is if you go to YouTube, type in Curtis Judd Audio, Isotope RX-7 Loudness. You will find a, there are actually several times that we covered that that will tell you exactly how to do the loudness normalization in RX. Now, if you want to do any so other sort of sweetening or cleanup, you can do that in RX as well. We also have, um, we have a video where we talk specifically about doing audio for a film where we used Adobe Audition to do the mix and we used RX-7 to do some of the cleanup. So I would look at that as well. We actually have done that a couple of times, at least twice. Um, so that those are probably your best bets. And hopefully those are good re resources for you to get everything that you need there. All right. So that covers all the questions for there. And we're at about an hour here. Um, let's take a quick look through things here. All right. Wow, we got a lot of comments. <laughs> I may not be able to get to all of them, but we're going to try our best here. All right, just kind of running through things. We talked about what the EBU is, LUFS. Um, all right, here's a question from Norm. Would you happen to know if the new A10 Mini Pro can delay audio to sync external audio to external video? Uh, not both through HDMI. Um, I don't know that it has that feature, and I know that the current version, the, the A10 Mini, the non-pro version, does not, as far as I'm aware. In fact, I learned just this week that it applies a one-frame offset automatically, so it holds audio for one frame based on what its current frame rate is, and then sends the audio. When it first came out, actually, this was interesting, it used to offset by seven frames. Evidently, a lot of people complained about that, and they changed it to one frame, hard-coded. As far as I can tell, there's no parameter to change that setting. As a result of that, I don't typically use the audio inputs on the A10 Mini. Instead, I run audio to camera and uh, just let the audio stream through on the camera. So that's the way I've been approaching it. So good question, Norm. I, and again, I don't know. I, I have an A10 Mini Pro on order, but uh, don't know when they're going to come. But when we do, um, we'll take a look at that and see what, what things look like here. Okay, um, basic question. What is the order of applying the plugins with respect to normalization, noise removal, EQ, compression, limiter, etc.? Ah, this, th this is not a basic question. <laughs> well, I mean, you, it, you could approach it as a basic question, but it could be a very in-depth discussion as well. 
I, I generally do this. If I'm going to do noise reduction, I, well, here's what I do. If, if the, depending on where the audio is coming in from the start, I'll often normalize it um, just to kind of a, not, 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 not to a delivery standard, but just to something that's workable, that, that makes it easy to work with. So for example, I'll normalize a mono audio track to minus 28 LUFS. That's not going to be the final level, but it's good enough to get started. So then I will typically do my noise removal. Um, I'll use an EQ to do cleanup initially. So this is not for sweetening. This is just for cleanup. So I'll do a high pass filter, um, remove any really kind of annoying frequencies based on the combination of the, the talent's voice and the microphone and kind of how however they're interacting. So if something's coming through and the mid frequencies are really harsh, I'll, I'll do a cut there, for example. So mostly cuts at this point. Um, then I will typically apply the compression. Then I will do any sort of sweetening EQ. Then I will, as I do the normalization, I'll also apply a limiter at the same time. So that's kind of the general idea of those particular things that I will do and the order in which I do them. Now, that when I say sweetening with EQ at that point, that's where I may be doing some boosts. I don't do a lot of that, to be honest. Um, but every once in a while it's necessary. Like for example, sometimes I've gotten really muffled lavalier recording tracks and sometimes they're just so muffled that it, they're not, there's not a lot of articulation. They're difficult to understand what's happening. And in those cases, I'll, I'll put a high shelf in them on them in a lot of cases. And sometimes you have to be surprisingly aggressive with those <laughs> to get them to a point where they work pretty well. Um, some of you may have seen the YouTube channel Snazzy Labs. So he's a tech reviewer. He's actually here in Salt Lake, not too far from me. Um, I've worked with him on a, a few things on a consulting basis, and he did a recent video where he um, he got a new he got a new wireless system. We had worked on some things, and he got a new wireless system, and they just mic'd him badly in, in some of the, for for some of the video. It was a video where he added his own aftermarket wheels to his Mac Pro, kind of a, a silly goofy kind of thing. It was a it was a fundraiser, but it was funny and so on and so forth. But he contacted me in a little bit of a panic. He's like, oh, we can't, I don't want to have to reshoot this. It's it's a really long video. Some of the clips came through and they were really, really bad. What can we do? And it was surprising how much high frequency shelving we had to add to add some of that articulation back. And it wasn't a great sound in the end, but it was at least listenable um, and you could understand what he was saying. So so those are some thoughts there. So thanks for that question. Improve scripting. All right. Does stretching wild tracks in post require a higher sample rate? I think ideally, yes, it would. If you had higher samples, it would allow you to do that. But I think that's part of what the, um, what's the plugin called again? Wave, whatever it's called. <laughs> I think it's going to do some resampling there as well. So yes, ideally, um, you would need some of that. So that might be a case for doing your ADR in 96 kilohertz. Interesting. <clears throat> ah, there's some question here about uh, Resolve Studio being necessary to read GH5 10-bit files. Interesting, I didn't know that. That's good to know. So that's the paid version of, Stu of uh, Resolve that you would need there. All right. Lloyd brings up an interesting point. So Mark's question earlier about uh, USB field recorders as audio interfaces. Um, I barely trust USB for hours. Personally, I would not trust it for days or longer. I think that's a good point. Um, and it could be that, that that's happening. So especially if you have power saving features on your computer, Mark, that could be part of what tripped things up. Um, a lot of computers have built in, especially laptops, have built in power saving things that they use. And when you start doing stuff like that with audio interfaces, all sorts of confusion can happen. So that's actually a good point, Lloyd. I'm glad you brought that up. That could well be what happened there. Um, might also need a firmware update. That's a fair point as well. So Mark, if you, if you don't have the latest firmware update, that's worth looking at. Robbie, where is Curtis taking these questions from? So Robbie, if you are not signed up or... Um, you don't have to, I'm just saying. <laughs> if you sign up at school.learnlightandsound.com, um, you, you can get a free account. And I send out an email there and I solicit for questions every week. 
And so people just reply to me there, send their questions, I compile them, and that's where that's where these questions come from. You don't have to do it, um, but if you'd like to, you're welcome to do that. And Kevin also, and so is that. <laughs> Same with Trevor. Thanks, guys. Uh, Lloyd, my Mix Pre 6 will lose functioning audio sometimes after the computer goes to sleep. So that would be kind of a case for the kind of power saving or, you know, just maintaining state between the two devices gets muddled up. So it's good info, good information there. All right. Uh, Rob will normally normalize, then low cut and compression as needed, then apply a limiter and last of all, noise reduction if required. Interesting. So there's a different kind of approach there. Good information. Rob's a professional. He, I'm sure he knows what he's doing as well. So I normally do the, the reason I do the noise reduction. Oh yeah, there's some other things I do in there typically as well. For especially for men's voices, I find that the waveforms are often asymmetric. Noise reduction will emphasize that in many cases. So typically I don't do it last because of that. So I will typically do my noise reduction and then I will apply um, the uh, dynamic phase rotation which is an isotope RX-7 advanced. Actually, it's in, also in the standard version, I believe. Um, but what that does is it, nor it, it fixes the waveform. So if it's sticking way up on one side, but not going nearly as far away from the infinity line on the other side, you're basically being robbed of headroom. And what I like to use is do that phase rotation so that I have the equal amount of headroom on both sides. That makes it so I don't have to do as much compression. And so it doesn't affect the sound of the audio quite as much. So it's generally a, a worthwhile trade-off. <clears throat> Alejandro, not that I do anything involving music, but do you see Fairlight evolving into music editing in a future update? That's a great question. I I don't really see Blackmagic Design as really trying to play in that space, but who knows? It's certainly a capable digital audio workstation, especially in the direction it's headed. So. Um, it, could, it certainly could do that. The interesting thing, though, is that there are so many other DAWs out there. <laughs> um, I've been, and this is, I think this came up later on, I've, my, my primary DAW, for better or worse, is Audition. Um, I now have Logic Pro 10. I've been playing with that. I did my last, um, I have a podcast, and on my podcast, I did the last mix in Final Cut Pro 10. Uh, I have Logic, or sorry, I've, sorry, sorry. I did it in Logic Pro, and then I also have Pro Tools, and I've done some of the mixing for some of the other podcasts that I've worked on in that, both my own and other podcasts. And then, um, of course, now there's Fairlight, so <laughs> I'm all over the place on those, but um, I don't really, I, Alejandro, my guess would be no, but um, there are so many other DAWs out there. Studio One's a very popular one. Reaper's a very popular one. And all of these are very capable. The interesting thing is that most of them are oriented for music production. And so it's always been a little bit more of a stretch for the film people to use them, kind of. Um, so anyway, that's those are some of my thoughts on that. Mark says, I guess it's time to bite the bullet and get a mix pre and <laughs> Windows has a habit of changing the default inputs when turning a new device on. So I was planning on just leaving it turned on. I see, okay. Yeah, that's the trick with USB and, and computers is you don't always know what's going on behind the scenes and the controller could be doing some things. The operating system could be doing some things. So there's just a lot going on back there. So you just need to find the RTA, we found it. Um, so you can get to work on that. American Liberty, on the A10 Mini, is there a delay between audio and video stream? Yes, one frame. So the audio com is synced up one frame later than the video. The idea is to give the video a little bit longer to get out of the camera because typically there's more latency at the camera. Um, so there's that. Silly question, are you using your SM7B windscreen on your audio Stellar? It looks pretty similar, um, but they're different sizes. So no, technically this is the one that came with the Stellar. And the reason I, I'm doing this as opposed to a pop filter, just because the pop filters are so big, really good for voiceover, but when you're doing video, they get kind of in the way. Um, but no, they have a they have their own that it comes with. This is a surprisingly decent microphone. It's 250 bucks. I'm a little surprised. Rob made me buy it. And uh, thanks, Rob. <laughs> All right, Kevin. 
Regarding getting a mixed pre, make sure you take Curtis's mixed pre course. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Daniel says the resolve manual indeed is quite helpful and indeed over 3,000 pages. <laughs> More of a reference manual. Um, but yeah, if there's a particular topic, they have some good information in there. Oh, Mark already has the mixed pre course. So thank you, Mark. All right, uh, Jason asks about, this is about the Evo 4. So for those that are not aware, we did a review of this budget audio interface called the Evo 4. It's made by a company called Audient, who actually makes some higher end interfaces, pretty popular in the voiceover world in particular. And I think a little bit more in the music world as well. Um, but this is really kind of a very simple one, two input, well, two XLR combo inputs plus a Hi-Z instrument input. And the question is, if that Hi-Z input on the Evo 4 is shared or mixed with input one or two or the master bus. So what happens, Jason, is that when you, when you do use the Hi-Z input, that takes the place of input one. So input one basically poof, disappears and becomes the instrument input. And then you still have input two to use for a microphone. So it's really, it sticks, it's it's really just a two. I don't know why they call it a four, Evo four exactly. Every company uses these numbers and they all mean different things by them. <laughs> the 888. Um, anyway, so they all mean different things. So you have to be careful, but that hopefully that answers your question there. So it is, it's very limited. It's a, it's a $129 audio interface. It's, um, it's audio inputs are actually quite high quality. They don't provide a ton of gain. So you're not going to drive dynamic mics like the SM7B unless you're going to do any sort of normal, some normalization on post. And because the microphone inputs are so clean, you can easily do that. Um, but if you're live streaming, it would be a bit of a problem unless you're using a cloud lifter or something like that. So that's, that's the short version of the review if you don't want to go watch the review. <laughs> All right, um, Kevin. Uh, oh, the course is the Mixed Pre User Manual. Absolutely, thanks, Kevin. Greg asks, have you compared the quality of the A10 receiver AES output to analog XLR output? Is there a big advantage in using direct AES to the mixer recorder? Well, I haven't done any formal tests on that, Greg. Um, typically, I will use the AES output when I'm using it. I haven't noticed any sort of weird artifacting um, but I have not done a specific side-by-side -side test. Now, as as we know, the Audio Limited A10, and let's just, I can actually switch over to, here's the, my bag isn't fully built out right now, but here is the receiver. We can actually turn that on. <clears throat> um, the A10 actually transmit, transmits digitally at 44.1 kilohertz. And so if I'm recording at 48, there is a, Ooh, I don't know if you can hear that. Powerful transmitters interfere with my speakers. <laughs> um, it transmits at 44.1 kilohertz, and I'm recording at 48 kilohertz on the mixer, so there is some resampling that's taking place there. I have never noticed any sort of artifacting that caused me any concern. Um, so it's an interesting, it's kind of an interesting setup but um, hasn't hasn't been problematic and the audio quality that we're getting out of it is very good but it's probably a test that i should do at some point and so i'm glad you asked that thank you greg all right come back over here cloud you is Fairlight considerably better than Audition? The only thing i find making it a better choice for pro post-production is that it can import aaf uh, well, that's always a tough question to say what's better. I think really it's a workflow question as to, you know, what makes the most sense for your workflow. The nice thing about Resolve, of course, and Fairlight is that it's an all-in-one solution. There's no round tripping you'd have to do, at least in theory. <clears throat> it has some remote um, features that allow you to work on a project remotely. I haven't tested those out, but that's something that, that could be really helpful for some teams especially right now during the pandemic when we're trying to socially distance. Um, it's, like I said, I, th I feel like 
I feel like Fairlight is moving in a really good direction, and at some point I can see myself potentially moving there. Certainly when I'm working on and mixing films, especially if it was edited in DaVinci Resolve. Um, at this point, I'm not quite as familiar with it as I'd like to be. I definitely feel more at home in Audition. So those are some thoughts there. I don't know that it's really fair to say one is better than the other necessarily. I would say that the feature set's a little bit more mature in Audition, but that's been around. That application has been around a lot longer as well. So um, I feel like that uh, Fairlight will be pretty amazing once they've built out more of the functionality. All right, Mark has spent far too long on the real manual today. I still don't know if the two USB cable is enough to supply enough for full power mode or if it will stick in low power. Oh, okay, if you're talking about the MixPre, there, the originals came with a USB-C cable on one end and then two USB-A cables connectors on the other end. And Mark, the, the, the reason that that's not in the manual is, and I actually talked to Paul Isaacs about this, it depends on the USB ports on your computer. The reality is, is on computers, and they don't always disclose this, they don't all necessarily meet the full USB power spec. And especially on laptops, you'll find that some of those USB ports won't supply the full 5 volts um, 2.1 amps. They'll have different currents that they'll supply, um, different amperage. So that's why they can't always answer that question. The Mix Pre will tell you whether or not it has enough power, so you'll have to try different USB ports to see um, what you can find out. So that is a, yeah, that's a tough one, and um, it does, it, de it depends on the USB ports is the short answer. <laughs> Claudio, uh, Kevin, Basic Filmmaker, I love your toots. You're awesome. Likewise, Kevin's uh, Kevin's putting together some great information out there. If you haven't checked out his channel, it's worth having a look at for sure. All right, Mike Kelly, I use the two USB on my Mix Pre 3 and it runs under full power. So yeah, so it again, depends on the USB ports, but it should you should be able to do that with most. Um... Trevor says, the two USB cable will need the pull-up resistor to allow the Mix Pre to see the cable as able to supply full power. And I'm not sure... Well, I think he's referring... Trevor, I think he's referring specifically to the the sound devices cable in this case, the one that's produced by sound devices, and that, that one should... Yeah, and Mark confirms that's the one he uses, the one that came in the box with the original Mix Pre. All good. Regarding projects, when you're starting out, you take the gigs that are offered, but none are what you'd want your friends to spend money on <laughs> if you want them to stay friends. Okay, fair point. Yep. I think that's good advice there. All right. Kevin says, I've seen you bounce between Premiere Pro, that was many years ago, Final Cut Pro, DaVinci Resolve, Audition, etc., etc., etc. Do you find it easy or do you have to burn the midnight oil to learn all these? I don't I don't know Resolve that well. I have done some editing for a while in it. Um, I know Fairlight a little bit. I definitely know Audition better for audio. For Final Cut Pro, I have this weird addiction. And Final Cut Pro 10, if you've never edited in it, it, this will not make sense necessarily if I say this, but it has this magnetic timeline that makes editing video such a dream. Um, once it once it clicks, once it makes sense to you, because it's very different than Premiere, Final Cut, Avid Media Composer, so on and so forth. So it's different than all the kind of the traditional track-based um, video editing apps where you define which track the video goes on. In Final Cut Pro 10, you, you have a main storyline, which is kind of the main track, but then you can stack all your other stuff in and it just kind of works like this magnetic timeline. It, it, <laughs> I don't know how best to describe it, but once you get it, the reason I like it is I can edit faster with Final Cut Pro 10. So the problem with Final Cut Pro 10 is it's awful when it comes to doing a proper mix. Like if you really want to get into the audio and mix it like you typically would for a feature film or even a short film where you really were trying to invest in the sound and get a great sound, it's not great for that. And the round trip process, unless you're using Logic Pro 10, which is why I bought Logic Pro 10 recently, um, what you can do in Final Cut Pro 10 is you can identify each of the audio clips. You can assign them a role. But the problem is, is when you when you export an XML file and then take that over into Pro Tools or to Audition or 
you know, any other digital audio workstation aside from Logic, you get this massive jumble of disaster. And it's a horrible starting point to work with. And I've done it a number of times on a number of projects and it drives me crazy. It's just a lot of tedious work to get everything cleaned up and identified. And so you have a sane environment where you know where you can go to sweeten and clean and choose different tracks and so on and so forth. Um, Final Cut Pro and Logic work much better that way because Logic no, uh, Logic reads those audio rolls and, com- and, and groups them appropriately. So that makes the cleanup a lot easier. I don't find it easy to make the jump. Logic Pro, I feel really limited, like to do the most basic and simple things. It takes me a long time to figure it out. So <clears throat> it's not magical. All of us need time to learn. <laughs> so, all right. So Mark says, thanks for the info, folks. I was looking at their official overly expensive MX USB Y cable. Yeah, that's the one that I was talking about. All right. And Trevor clarifies when the mix pre is in low power mode, it means you can only phantom power two XLR ports. So good to know. All right, Rob, thank you for the super chat. Very much appreciate that. Um, Rode, Rodecaster Pro. Yes, that's what we were talking about earlier. So that, that would be my thought on that. And thanks, Mark, for the super chat. Really appreciate that as well. Okay. Kevin, do you or have you um, have a video or blog post or something on getting some sweet podcast audio? I'm tinkering with podcasting. I do have a course called um, Processing Dialogue Audio with Adobe Audition. Um, that covers that. So that's that's one thing I have. Um, I think a lot of the same things really apply with podcasting that we've talked about here for filmmaking. If you're posting to the web, so you're going to hit the same loudness targets. You're hitting your for podcasting. You, I would recommend you go for minus sixteen LUFS, minus sixteen, minus seventeen in that range. Um, but in terms of sweetening, the most comprehensive view of that I have is I have an old video where I talked about dialogue processing, dialogue post-processing for film and video. If you do a search on my YouTube channel, you'll find that. That's a pretty old one. That was from like 2015, maybe 2016. (laughs) Um, So some things have changed, but the general process is there. And then I have the course as well. So I may, may need to re, I may need to update that again. Not the course, but the, but do another video on my main channel just to kind of cover that. All right. Greg asks, are you booming wirelessly? If you do, where do you put the transmitter and how do you mount it? Uh, I typically don't, Greg. I have that capability and the Audio Limited A10 system has a little add-on clip that you can put on your boom pole. Unfortunately, the one that it comes with actually clips it at the top of the pole where you have the mic also, so you get this kind of unbalanced kind of situation. It works, but it's a little unbalanced. Um... But I've seen people fashion that. I know Alan Williams, who's a boom operator out in Atlanta, he uses the A10 system, A10 system, and he actually took that. It's a little, it's a little clip with a hole on it that goes through the three eighths inch um, screw at the top of your boom pole. He actually changed that and fashioned a way to to attach it to the end, the other end of his pole, I believe. I think he did that. Or if not, I've seen some other people do that. So it balances out the pole a little bit better. So you're still running cabled through the pole if you have an internally cabled pole and then that goes into the a10 and then from there um, wireless to the mixer so i don't do that typically i'm usually doing the mixing and the booming at the same time so i'm just wired typically all right kevin i think curtis has the roadcaster pro but i assume he goes through the mix pre that's true so we're going through a mix pre here today um, but I do have the Rodecaster Pro, and I've, I have think it's a great device as well. Kevin, uh, Bandrup Podcastage has a couple of videos and a couple of solid ar- articles on his website, including a checklist for doing your own podcast. There you go. There's some good info. All right. Rob says, 
Curtis and everyone else here, me and Buddy doing our first live stream tomorrow night. We're watching the same movie in our own homes, then doing a post show over analyzing it. Any tips? Uh... <laughs> Any tips? Well, the thing is, is I have not had great luck doing remote live streams. I have uh, just a hard time keeping enough bandwidth. I don't know if it's bandwidth or latency that's tripping things up, but every time I've tried to do it remotely and live stream at the same time, I've had some problems. But your internet connection may be a lot better than my internet connection. So that's one thing. I would do lots of tests first. Even if you can if you can do a test where you actually stream to your YouTube channel or wherever you're sending it privately so that it's not going out to the world, but at least that way it's testing the bandwidth to make sure you have enough bandwidth. That's the main thing I would look at. Um, so definitely... Best of luck. I'm going to go see if I can check it out. Oh, Claudio, cheap and cheesy transition tutorials from any amateur YouTuber have 50,000 plus views and pro sound tutorials have less than 2,000. It's kind of sad. Well, you are changing that trend tonight by watching this video live. So, and I, uh, I concur with American Liberty. Have fun doing the stream. Uh, Greg says, never really done ADR, but I was wondering if showing the actor a spectrogram of the original track would help them with matching the timing and emphasis. Any experience? I have not done that. I have an initial thought on that, though. I would think that might be too much information for them. Typically, when you're doing a looping, an ADR looping session, um, what you're doing is you're playing that clip through several times, and they just do it several times until you you feel like you have a good take so for them watching the visuals of the film usually is the easiest way to do that for most actors is my sense my guess but again not being an experienced adr engineer i'm not sure but that would be my thought i would think that seeing the visuals of the film would help an actor more than the waveform but there's a thought there all right i think a key to con connecting with a streaming audience is to be natural and relatable. I think that's good advice. That's very good advice. All right, Let's Celebrate TV says, our cooking show is starting to dual multiple chefs in the kitchen. I have a mix pre six with mix assist. Do you think the delay from the DD Connect will cause any issues with mix assist? I would not think so. So I think it depends on what your setup is. So, <clears throat> Um, I don't know how you have things routed. So I don't know if your mix pre is connected directly to your camera. Um, but if you are finding that there is enough latency that it is problematic and you are feeding the audio to camera and that's the audio you're using in your edit, you can actually just slide that over it, you know, a little bit, some portion of a frame. It's, it's usually, I think 19 milliseconds is the latency that you'll experience on the connect system. If you have it in the default latency mode, the low latency mode. Um, and unless you're experiencing any sort of dropouts on a regular basis, I would leave it in the low latency mode. And usually that's not a problem. You can slip it just a little bit in post if you need to. Most people are, I mean, I guess you could, you could start to see a difference at 19 milliseconds. Most people say that the human threshold for noticing latency or that something is off in terms of sync is about 10 millisecond milliseconds and I think that's going to take a really sharp person to notice that in most cases um, it's at 20 milliseconds I think people most people can start to notice it so if you are using a boom microphone plus the deity connect system you will want to use the um, audio delay feature in the mix pre to get those two in sync so that they are not off from each other that'll make things a lot easier for you in post and just apply a 19 millisecond uh, delay to the boom microphone and that'll get them all back in sync so, Greg, thanks for the super chat. Thanks for sharing your knowledge. And likewise, Greg, thanks for sharing yours. Um, always appreciate your input and your questions. They're super helpful here. All right. Back to Rob regarding voiceover mar mi microphones. If you're using it for ACX or Audible, the noise floor of the mic is super important. You will want to avoid noise, re noise reduction in post if you can or with a really light touch. I agree. And that's true for film as well. As soon as you start doing noise reduction, um, there's artifacting. You can't do a whole lot of noise reduction before things start, even the really good ones. 
Um, even the one that we looked at a couple of weeks ago, the Accentis, Accentis, is that, I can't, I think that's what it calls a voice gate. Um, you wouldn't want to go too crazy with that stuff. And I think especially if you have an audio only program, like a podcast or an audio, audio books in particular, where they have standards, um, you're going to want to probably be in a voice booth of some sort, or at least a, a really good closet with lots of clothes and not a lot of noise bleeding in. And yes, you definitely want to have a microphone that doesn't have a lot of uh, self noise. So for example, Rob, I believe you mentioned that you use the Rode NT1, at least as one of your microphones, and that's a very low self noise microphone for an example. So good point there. Appreciate that. Lloyd, Mix Pre, Mix Assist, and the Deity Connect work fine together. And I agree. Mix Appro yeah, Mix Assist should be great. I didn't catch that part of the question. My apologies, and thank you, Lloyd, for picking up on that. Uh, many professional voiceover artists are using the Sennheiser MKH-416 as the go-to. Indeed, they are. Um, what Rob is going to and friend are going to be looking at is Prospect on Netflix. That's what we're going to be reviewing. So, um, if you want to catch that, that'd be a good one to catch up on, Bob. Going to bed now. It's late out east. Great job. Thanks, Bob. Thanks for joining. Thanks for sticking around so long. All right. I'm hoping we will be. Mostly we're doing it because we used to do it IRL before the lockdown, and we missed that. This was a way to have some laughs and get a show out of it, too. That is a very constructive way to deal with the current circumstances. Um, since you are experienced, you know to be open and interact with chat. <laughs> Thank you, American Liberty. Uh, the actor watches their performance and usually has the original audio track fed to them via headphones so they can match their performance. Um, watches the performance on screen in the booth, of course. Uh, Greg asks, what's your understanding of the difference between Sound Devices Dugan Auto Mix and the Sound Devices Mix Assist and the Zoom Auto Mix? Good question. Um, Sound Devices is actually very open about how the two different auto mixes work. The Dugan basically operates on the principle that the oh, all of the microphones in the mix, in the auto mix, however many there are, share the overall um, mix level. So what they do, in other words, if two people start talking at the same time, they both come down a little bit to keep the overall mix level the same and then if if one microphone has most of the signal coming in it versus others these others are attenuated and this one gets all of the the mix level if that makes sense so there's always a sharing so as people talk over each other which is a i understand i'm actually told that's a very american thing europeans evidently don't do quite as much talking over each other <laughs> i'm told um but that's how basically Dugan Auto Mix works. Mix Assist, on the other hand, uses a series of rules. Um, it has a last open mic rule. So, for example, it will, um, whichever was the last mic used, if there's total silence, it will leave the last mic open and attenuate all the others. It also, if multiple mics have signal coming in at the same time, it will do a similar thing to Dugan Auto Mix, sort of, by attenuating all of them using a mathematical formula with the intent of keeping the overall mix level the same. Um, but it also has a number of other rules, and you can actually find those over on their website. And actually, when we talked about auto mix, um, specifically in the context of the Mix Pre, the Mix Assist on Mix Pre, we actually ran through the, the rule set really quickly in that Sound for Video session. So you might want to go check that out as well if that's of interest to you. So there is that and greg also says in regards to adr recording and maybe using a spectrogram might tell them more how to replicate performance just a thought never heard anyone doing it before and that is actually an interesting one and there may be actors where they, they you know it'd be worth trying and see if that works for them rob says not that i've seen but that doesn't mean it isn't done that said the actor is already watching their performance on the screen and listening to the guide track so um but it's an interesting idea and i think um Greg, if you ever find yourself in that situation, it might be worth experimenting with. Um, what specifically do I need to buy to go from the DBX-286S into a Canon D80 DSLR? Thanks much. Um, I'm going to have to look that up, and I will post those in the description on the live stream below. 
So thanks for the question again. So basically it's gonna be a quarter inch male TRS cable to come out of the DBX286S to a female TRS 3.5 millimeter jack. And then from there, you're going to need, actually no, that actually could be a, a male to male cable. So a quarter inch TRS to 3.5 millimeter TRS cable, male on both sides. And then the attenuator cable will have a female 3.5 millimeter TRS jack on one side and male on the other. So you will connect the quarter inch to 3.5 millimeter cable to the output of the DBX286S. Then you'll attach the female part of the attenuator cable to the 3.5 millimeter of the cable that's coming out of the DBX286S. And then the other end, the male end of the, t the attenuator cable into your GH or your Canon ADD. That's what you'll do. So I'll have to look those up and put them down after the show here. So thanks for the question. Is there any damage to normalizing an audio multiple times? <clears throat> if you are doing limiting at the same time, then potentially yes. So if you're not doing the compression on your own, um, then yes, you could potentially, if, if, if it limits on each time. Um, so I guess the question, or the answer is it depends, Kevin. <laughs> um, all right. Improved scripting, thanks a lot. You bet, thank you for the questions. When you run your limiter during final normalization, what is the max peak limit you use? Normally minus 1.5 dB true peak is where I set it. And the idea there is that you need to leave headroom because you're working with a WAV file. When it gets encoded to AAC or to MP3, which, whichever it's going to, depending on whether you're doing a podcast or a video, um, that headroom gets eaten up. So you need to make sure that's, that remains there. And if you're going to broadcast, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the broadcast standards have different dB true peak ceilings that are required. So you have to follow the spec, whatever it is, if you're going to a TV show. So typically for web, um, I will leave 1.5 dB true peak. Uh, regarding professionals, you are too kind. Just calling it like I see it. <laughs> Jason says, just as a point, I power my Motu M4 interface over USB from an Anchor USB hub, which powers the laptop and everything. And I've never had any issue having it powered for months at a time. Interesting. Okay. So there's some information for you, Mark. Um, and Jason goes on, recording interfaces, I think, must be much more complicated. And I suspect many may, in fact, be ARM-powered Linux computers. I think you're probably probably right on many of those. Alejandro, before I invest in an audio interface, can I use my F8 in the meantime? I can't remember if you covered that in the F8, F8N course. Yes, you can use it. And yes, we cover it in the, uh, the course in terms of how to get it set up, how to connect it to your computer, um, how to get it into the mode to use it as an audio interface, and also how to connect monitors if you're going to do that. So we cover that in the course there. Um, Hansang. For those on Windows that need more USB information, Microsoft has a USB view tool. It's free and gives you much more information about your USB devices. That's potentially useful. Um, and then Jason says, ah, <laughs> as suspected, it's actually an Evo 2. Yeah, sorry to burst any bubbles there, but yeah, I I don't know where the four count comes from exactly. Four in and, or two in and two out? Maybe that's where the four comes from. Um, so, all right. Kevin asks, uh, you seem to pull stuff out all the time that are battery powered and they're all active and working. What's the secret? You must have 500 batteries. No, I hate batteries and I hate trying to keep them managed. I use big batteries is what I do, Kevin. And I power as many things from the big batteries as I can. So even on this live stream setup, the Mix Pre is powered via a uh, V-mount battery, uh, 90, 95 watt hour battery. The monitor, the little external auxiliary monitor that I use here is also powered via a V-mount battery. The Mix Pre here has all of its own batteries here. We've got, um, we've got a couple of these um, Inspired Energy smart batteries. These are 90, what's their spec? Um, 98 watt hour batteries. So I just use big batteries. That's the short version. So 
<laughs> or, as Mike Kelly says, the basic filmmaker, Curtis keeps an arc reactor hidden in his bag. I wish you wouldn't have told anyone that, Mike. Ooh, inside info. <laughs> um, please define high shelf, if I heard correctly. Yes, in an EQ. Um, in fact, let's see if we can pull up an EQ and show you one here. Let's get back over into Resolve. Uh, we can show that here. Actually, let's go over here. This is a high shelf. You see what it does? So a typical point in an EQ will be a peak, but a high shelf works like this. It just lifts everything over a certain frequency or cuts everything over a certain frequency. Just like a high cut, or sorry, a high pass filter. Um, this a high pass filter will typically, uh, basically is a shelf filter as well. So it will pull everything down below a certain frequency. So hopefully that makes sense, Scott. All right. I think we need to run, people. It's getting awfully late here. It's, it's almost, we're running up on two hours. So <laughs> um, thanks so much for everyone that joined. Thanks for the great questions that you submitted ahead of time. Get out there. Well, keep your distance from other people. Um, wash your hands. Don't touch your face. I actually touched my face at least once during this live stream. I caught myself doing it. Don't do that. Um, and make some great sound. Learn your equipment. Do what you can there. And we'll talk to you again next week. Take care, everybody.